Listen now for the word of God. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gate. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, happy new year. Break out the noisemakers and the silly glasses, play some old Lang Syne and prepare your best countdown. I promise I haven't completely lost it. I do know that Thanksgiving was just on Thursday. So this New Year's talk may seem a little bit out of place, but this is the first Sunday of Advent. Today marks the first day of the new church year. So happy new year to you all as we begin once again our journey through the life of Christ and the church, beginning with anticipating his birth. When we celebrate New Year's, we typically see retrospectives on the morning news, best of lists in newspapers and magazines. We look back, but we also look ahead. We make resolutions to try to make the upcoming year a better one. I don't know about you, but for me, celebrating a new year feels a little bit different right now. For many of us, our Thanksgivings were different than we are used to, a fitting representation of a year that has seemed like any other we have known. For some, 2020 has held little to celebrate. Proms and graduations were canceled. Weddings were postponed or trimmed down to a much smaller celebration. Family gatherings had to be relocated to screens or closed windows. There was no Riverbend Festival or Pride Parades or summer conferences at Montreat. Jobs were lost. People suffered illness. Many people grieved loved ones alone. People continued to die because of unjust systems and policies rooted in racism. We have been through another rough election season. Our country and world has seen a lot of turmoil, and we will probably see 2021 start in much the same way that 2020 is ending. We'll still be facing a pandemic and uneasy transitions. So what is celebrating supposed to look like now, and what resolutions can we make? This season of Advent, this time apart, invites us to rethink remembering and anticipating. As we begin this season in the church, we are not given a sweet story about the baby Jesus. We aren't greeted with the Christmas card picture of Mary, Joseph, and the infant lying in the manger. Instead, we are thrust ahead to the very end of the story. We encounter the words of a fully grown Jesus just before his death. And they are words about the end of things. Jesus has entered Jerusalem for the final time, and he has had more encounters and conflicts 
with the powers that be in and around the temple in Jerusalem. As he addresses his disciples in what was becoming a more chaotic atmosphere for them, Jesus shifts into a prophetic mode. He talks about coming destruction of all things. He warns his listeners that the days to come would include the temple falling, false messiahs being proclaimed, and war and destruction appearing all around. His followers will be handed over and kicked out of their community. Jesus has very little good news to share in this part of Mark's gospel. And this grim tone makes a little more sense when we think about the community that the evangelist Mark was writing for. Most biblical scholars agree that this gospel was likely written somewhere around the neighborhood of the year 70 CE, which is when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed for the second and final time. And the Jewish people, including their Christian cousins, uh, fell into disfavor with the Roman Empire. At the same time, the burgeoning Christian community was facing increasing separation from their Jewish roots. So this doom and gloom makes it seem like maybe Jesus was onto something. Jesus' disciples, both during his life and after, needed to hear some words that would help them through these difficult and chaotic times. And so in the middle of his warnings about the troubles to come, Jesus speaks in language that would be familiar to his hearers. Hearkening back to the writings in the books of Daniel and Ezekiel, Jesus uses apocalyptic imagery to explore what is to come and how his followers should approach it. In Daniel chapter seven, the son of man coming in the clouds, that image is referenced. And there, as Mogens Muller notes, this figure is not seen to be a messianic figure, but rather represents one, rep represents a victorious Israel, the kingdom of the saints of the most high. Jesus though, seems to use the term to reference to himself here in this passage. So by referring to the son of man and using familiar imagery, like the sun being darkened and stars falling from the sky, Jesus acknowledges the chaotic nature of what is coming and also calls forth the understanding that in the end, God and God's people will be victorious. And this understanding is not necessarily a foregone conclusion. It requires faith and that faith is a gift of God. Through the use of apocalyptic writings in scripture, God spoke into the midst of situations that seemed bleak and hopeless. There was no reason to think that the cause of the Israelites or the Jews or the early Christians should prevail. Their New Year's retrospectives would likely look fairly grim, but God gave a gift in those situations, the gift of revelation and the faith to understand it. And the gospel writings had a similar purpose and a similar function for the early Christian community. And they can have a similar function for us too. Femi Perkins writes that the apocalyptic analogies do highlight an important element in the gospel genre. The truth about its hero, the truth about the gospel's hero cannot be divorced from a revelation of God's purposes. So it's important to remember that Mark's first audience knew the end of this particular story. Jesus would die, yes, but that was not the end. Jesus doesn't stay in the tomb. And that post-resurrection perspective allowed them and can allow us to see through the frightening prospect of wars and false messiahs and even creation being turned on its head to the ultimate victory of God. God's purposes for life cannot be thwarted, even by death itself. A new year, a new age, a new world is being ushered in. And so with it, some resolutions are called for. From the fig tree, learn its lesson, Jesus says. Just as the trees point to the seasons, there are signs that this new age is imminent. This Thursday, like many of you, I imagine, 
I got to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on TV. It's one of my favorite Thanksgiving traditions. I love to see the Broadway shows and the floats and the balloons and hear the bands and all that goes with it. And while this year's was different than most in many ways because of the pandemic, a few constants remained. And after you've watched the parade for enough years, you start to be able to read it. There are signs to let you know where you are in the event. The giant Tom Turkey float is always one of the first ones to make its way through Herald Square. And as the parade moves on, the floats take on increasingly Christmassy themes. The Radio City Rockettes usually perform very near the end of the parade when Santa will finally make his big appearance. I love how the parade moves its viewers through the holidays from Thanksgiving to Christmas as the spectacle continues. When you know the signs, you can notice them and use them to orient yourself. In this passage, Jesus lets his hearers and Mark lets his readers know that there are signs to point the way to their hoped for new beginning. They need only keep alert. Earlier in this chapter, after Jesus predicted that the temple would be destroyed, some of his disciples asked him when this would happen, understandably so. And the rest of this chapter, this 13th chapter, is Jesus's answer. And finally, here in verse 32, Jesus gives the most direct response to the disciples' question. But it might not be the response they were hoping for. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. Using yet another parable, Jesus wraps up this answer and this long teaching by emphasizing that no one, not even him, knows when things as we know them will end and when God's new creation will be fully realized. But the fact that it isn't known doesn't mean that we can't discern it to some degree. And the fact that it isn't known doesn't mean that they are allowed to passively wait. Keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. Anyone who has some military background or knowledge of it will understand the imagery of night watches. It is important that someone be alert and aware of what is happening in order to protect and inform the rest of the unit should something or someone arise. And it is particularly important during the night when it is difficult to see and when all our bodies want to do is sleep. Someone has to be awake and actively watching ready to prod others into action if, if needed. The night watches call for agitational waiting, as Roger Ginch described it in his commentary this week. Mark's exhortation to vigilance deserves a special attention as we begin our journey through the season of Advent, he wrote. For make no mistake about it, the waiting and watching and wakefulness of, a, of which it speaks is by no means passive. It is unmistakably agitational. It is a watching that prompts action. It involves looking for the signs and acting upon them. At the start of this new year, in this Advent season, maybe we aren't supposed to fall into a post-celebration stupor. Maybe we aren't supposed to insulate ourselves from the world in the midst of our trees and lights and baked goods. Instead, at the start of this new year, Jesus calls us to make a resolution to keep awake. We are to look for the signs of the Son of Man and God's victory here and now. We are called to a vigilance that scrutinizes where we may leap into action, joining in at those points where God's future is struggling toward realization now, Ginch writes. And where do we find those signs? This passage suggests that we will find them in those places which seem the most hopeless, where the sun is darkened, where stars fall from the sky, where illness is rampant, where depression is heavy, there 
God is gathering and restoring. NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, has been working for over 40 years to support the total well being of those affected by mental illness in our country. During these last eight months of global pandemic, they have been working to support and offer resources to individuals and families who are struggling. Recently, they announced a partnership with many other organizations to launch Frontline Wellness, recognizing the mental health toll that our frontline workers and first responders are paying because of the constant stress and increased workload during this health crisis. NAMI jumped in to try to help. Resources include confidential and professional support, peer support, techniques to build resilience, support for family members, how to identify signs of a potential mental health emergency and suicide prevention information, their press release tells us. Recognizing an area of deep need, they found ways to respond and through supporting NAMI, offer others opportunities to join the effort. To me, this is just one sign of God's reign breaking in. Where there is pain, support is being offered. In the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the chaos, there are signs that can prod us to join God's action. We must keep awake, lest we miss Jesus' coming into the places we wish we could avoid. In her book, Searching for Sunday, Rachel Held Evans wrote about the darkness and how God surprises us there in her final chapter. She wrote, if I've learned anything in this journey, both in writing this book and clumsily living its content, it's that Sunday morning sneaks up on us, like dawn, like resurrection, like the sun that rises a ribbon at a time. We expect a trumpet and a triumphant entry, but as always, God surprises us by showing up in ordinary things, in bread, in wine, in water, in words, in sickness, in healing, in death, in a manger of hay, in a mother's womb, in an empty tomb. Even here, in the dark, God is busy making all things new. This year has been and continues to be tough in so many ways. We may not get to celebrate its end and the new year's arrival like we are used to, and we may not even feel much like celebrating at all. But happy new year, friends, because in the middle of this world's chaos, God is working and God has already overcome it all. The gift that we are given in this time of Advent and beyond is that we get to see the signs of God's work and join in. So keep awake. Amen.